With over 500,000 trees and shrubs already planted and growing, it's easy to forget you are in the city. We don't just say, we do. It's the Stain City Way. Good afternoon and welcome to Real Talk with me, Anel Mdoda. So this guy was born on a major day for the country, June 16. He was named the man of the match the very first time he played for the Springboks after coming on in the fifth minute of the game as an injury replacement. He has since done phenomenally well, currently as the first black African captain of the Stormers and talk in the rugby corridors has him fingered as the next probable Springbok captain. Mm, mm, mm. See, I'm trying to see Akalisi is here today to talk rugby, love and life and not in that order. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Uh, I like the way you asked, are we going to speak Kosa or English? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just, I just want to make sure. You just want to, yeah, you know, I got to build myself you up. You're be like, okay, which brain is operating? 100%. Kosa, yeah. back to and then English, if we talk like this, say, oh. <laughs> yeah, you got to chill, you know. Hey, yeah, hey, bro, hey? Yeah, you got to let me know. How's it going, eh? Cape Town, you know. Going Cape Town there, eh? Yeah. <laughs> no. I'm picking up what you're putting down, eh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, so I was laughing my head off. Yes. Uh, the one time you fall asleep in class and the teacher asks you, why are you sleeping? Yeah. Because, you know, this is your future, this is your education. And yes. you're like, it doesn't matter. I'm going to play for the Springboks. 100%. Actually, it was accounting. I still remember. I, I wasn't good at accounting and I was getting 12%. So I said, you know what? You got allowed to fail one subject. Okay. So I said, you know what, I'm going to sacrifice here. Uh -huh. I told him, I will sleep, do other homework, or do whatever I want, but I won't, I won't interrupt your classes. Like, well, I was like, I'm going to play rugby one day. And then I made my Springbok debut, and they called me. And they said, I remember you telling me you'll be a rugby player, and I'm proud of you. Hold on. But now you need an accountant, though. 100%. And I do. At, least, at least you hire somebody who didn't get yes, 12%. 100%. We can only hope. Yeah, we can't be good. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, yeah. So, where did this love of rugby start? Because I know you from PE, and I know yeah. that you know you were in Zwide side, which is a township. So, where yeah. does the love for rugby start? Actually, my whole family played rugby. My dad, his father, it all started from them. So, um, when I grew up, I, started, I tried soccer, it didn't work out. But then I played rugby. You didn't need much skill for rugby. You just have to be aggressive. So I started playing it and I got hurt a bit and I enjoyed it since I was playing since I was seven years old. Mm. Yeah, so I started playing in the township and it took me away from a lot of things. This is true. Yeah, this is true. Because a lot of my friends passed, passed on and they were on drugs. But I actually went to training every day after school. So that's how I got away from everything. So one of the most beautiful stories I know about you is the day you did your, your debut for the Springboks. Mm. You know, the people from your township, as we did in PE, yeah. were calling you and singing the songs yes. that they used to sing yes. in the taverns when they were supporting you when you were playing uh, in as we did. So how yeah. do you go from, you know, playing in the township and then making it to Grey High? Yeah, I actually met a teacher called uh, Eric Songwik, Mawawa, for some bees. Um, I played against his school. And we lost 50 nil. I was playing in a different school. And then he said, he saw something in me. I'm After like, you guys lost 50 nil. I'm like, dude, come on. And, and he said, you know what, just come to my school next the next year. But I left in the middle of the year without telling one. I just went to his school, rocked up at his gate. And I think it's probably the best decision I've ever made in my life. Because he took me to EP trials. I made the EP and the 12B team. And then there were scouts there. And they scouted me there to go to Gray. And then from then on, I played rugby. Is, when I say alma mater, what does that mean? Um, oh, my alma oh, my mater, old school. Yeah, alma that's mater, when, yeah. is that great PE? Yeah, that's great PE. And I understand your little brother's going there yes. now. How excited are you? I am, I'm so happy, you know. it's For me, like, the school has done so much for me. If that's where I think my, my, my life changed. That's where I started dreaming beat, you know. And being in the township, I didn't have a lot. There's no equipment and all that kind of stuff. There's no real good... There's support and stuff, that's all you have. And then I got to Gray. You have everything, all the facilities and everything. So, and it's always been a dream for me, for my brother to go to a proper school where he can actually be whatever he wanted to be. Oh, wow. Yeah. And wasn't it a little bit tough? Because, you know, um, a lot of, you know, kids that I speak to who are in sports, yeah. 
yeah, it's all about the support of your parents, yeah, you know. 100%. And I, your dad, the first time he was actually physically at a game to yeah. watch you was when you'd gone professional. So you yeah. didn't have that no. parental support. Yeah. Was that not difficult for you? Um, I didn't. I didn't have it from the township, so I didn't. I wasn't used to it, oh. you know. So it wasn't something that I was. Obviously, I would have loved to have him there, okay. but um, I make friends as long as my mates and my teammates are there. I'm, I was cool with it, but now it's a bit different because I would love to be at my brother's games. I don't. It doesn't matter what team is playing because I know what that kind of support does for someone. So yeah. I want to make sure for my little one and my brother and sister that I can be there as much as I can. Speaking of support, and I think you're very big on that, be yeah. it you're supporting your teammates, be yeah. it you, you are, you like the perfect talent for what you do because you are a fan of other rugby talent. Yeah, I, I listened to you talk about the first time you were at a game and Skulk Burger ran into the field and you yeah. said it was like a movie. Yeah. You, you were like, Yo, yeah. people were just making a noise. Yeah. You were like, yeah man, this is a movie. Yeah. And you wanted that feeling for yourself. Tell me about the day where you saw Skulk. Um, first off, I met Skulk when I was at Grey at in grade eight yeah. we were standing in lines and the springbok bus pulled in because they were playing in pe Goosebumps. yeah <laughs> and then the bus came in and i was like oh my goodness and they came out and they were so big we left the lines while the teacher was talking took out my hymn book and we started asking for signatures and I don't know why, but someone captured this picture of me and Skull. I rem that picture that made day. the rounds, actually. Yes, 100%. Oh, I'm so bleak, we don't yeah. have it. Yeah, that picture yeah. made the rounds. And he had all that hair. And yeah. I had no hair then. Um, I think they're all swapped now. <laughs> I've got all the hair and he's got nothing. <laughs> yeah, so then I, then I got to play with him. And that first time, he, he just came from the, from the World Cup mm. or Springbok duty. And I was playing and I was having such a good season. Which he World Cup was it? The one in, in England? Uh, no, the, the the one before. The one before that. Yeah, the one before that. I think France. It was in France. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think yeah. it was in France. Yeah. So he, so they came out. They came. Or he came on from the bench, and I'd never heard Newlands so loud in my life. So I just stood. From that moment on, I became a fan. I just stopped playing. I was just going through the motions, just watching him. He just, oh. you know, his aura, you know, everything he does. And he came on. He like smacked, broke someone's hand. First tackle he made, and I just looked at him like, what is happening right now? What a beast. You know? And then I saw him from then on, but then I got used to it, and mm. I got used to him, and it's very chill. It made me feel comfortable. Yeah, yeah. and I know you, you hold John de Villiers in high regard as yeah. well. Like, yeah. I think like when it comes to role models, like yeah. that's your dude. that's my guy, yeah. Him and Skalk, not only on the field, off the field as well. Yeah. I like the way he, he supports us youngsters, and mm. he brings us in, and he's very funny, but when it's time to work, it's time to work. Mm. And how he like supports his family and he's always there with his family that's what i like appreciate the most that's the stuff that i look i look uh, i look up to him for and when do you feel the most pressure when it comes to rugby because i mean you know yeah. um you came in and then and then you you had an injury so then yeah. you were kind of in a slump and then out of nowhere you came back and you yeah. were just like like more of a beast than before. Yeah. And this is why, I mean, you've possibly having the best time of your life yeah, and the best 100%. form of your life right yeah. now as the captain of the Stormers. And th you know, those rumors that we're looking at you as the next Springbok captain, like when mm. do you feel the, mes the most pressure when it comes to, to rugby? Um, I'm, I'm a very chill person. So I try to, I, I put pressure, for, I, I, like, I like putting pressure from like for myself. I don't read a lot of what's happening on the outside world, right? Ah. So I always try to, to make sure like I'm, I'm happy inside so I, so I can focus on playing. So my family must be happy. My wife must definitely be happy at all. Happy wife, yeah. happy life. 100%, yeah. <laughs> so when I'm happy, when f a family is good at home and my teammates are happy mm. and I've done my work and I'm prepared, then I think I'm at, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm at my best. That's when I can perform the most and I do my work as much as I can during the week. Then I'm f I feel prepared from Thursday and I'm playing on Saturday. Then I know it's, I'm, I'm good to go. And um, right before you run on the field, you know, is there like a, like a little thing you say to yourself, like a ritual, a memory you go back yeah. to? Um, I pray. Mm -hmm. I pray. Obviously, I listen to music. Then I pray. I'll pray with my t by myself, then with my teammates. Mm -hmm. And then I normally sing with my two Costa brothers in the team. <laughs> yeah, so it's a little more Guijonyana <laughs> in the changing room. Yeah. When you're listening to music, what's your pump-up song? I normally, 
First, I would have, I would have Beyonce. I would have all the. Don't stop talking. You said Beyonce. <laughs> 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 that's, that's what I wanted to hear. <laughs> Nothing else. Yeah. Beyonce, and we're done. Listen, no, we're gonna take that. a quick break, but stay tuned because on the other side, the love part of the story will be revealed. Come back to us. <laughs> Welcome back. If you've just joined us, we're talking love, family, and standing up for it all right here on Real Talk with Sia Kulisi, who is now joined by his wife, Rachel, who, I, look, I knew you were, like, good-looking. I just didn't realize you were this pretty. Like, I've seen you on TV and, like, on his Instagram post. I'm like, oh, what a pretty girl. Now I'm like, you better pay more cows. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you pay Lawala? Uh-uh. Ah, Rachel, no. man. Rachel. Still coming. I think my dad asked for like one cow. <laughs> <laughs> and it could have come like in steaks. <laughs> just like, if you just stand through steaks every week, <laughs> we'll all be happy. <laughs> What's the first thing he said to you? Hey. That's it. Really? On Facebook. Yeah. On Facebook. Oh, you went down in the DM. DM. <laughs> yeah. And look now. My, yeah. my response was literally like, don't uh, don't hate me in my inbox, please. Yeah. Okay. It was awkward. <laughs> and then, then I didn't know what to say. Because you know what it is. And now this story makes sense to me because I was like, rugby players, okay, like they're aggressive on the field okay. and it's everything there. But when it's time for them to like, uh -uh. ah, 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 weak. ah, 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 I kept on trying, I kept on SMSing it. Then yeah. we met up once and we became friends. We became very good friends for a while. But then, yeah, you know, that got too close. You, you were know? just like, yeah. I am not going to be friend zoned yeah. any longer. Yeah, yeah. I broke those chains so quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I broke those chains. And Rachel, still... you grew up in, in Grahamstown, am I correct in saying yeah. that? And yeah. you were quite sporty yourself. Yeah. What sports did you play? I loved sport. I was very into like hockey, squash. Tennis, athletics. Water polo. Water polo. Water yeah. polo. Yeah. All right. So when this this hay comes, do you know who's haying you? The guy that plays rugby or is yeah. it just... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We met at a dinner with yeah. like mutual friends. Oh. And um, we didn't my speak. brother made yeah. like a big deal about it. He was like, don't you know who he is? Like this big rugby player. I was like, oh, that's really cool. Like, mm -hmm. that's great. But no, don't really care yeah. much. I actually thought he was quite rude that night because he didn't really greet anyone. And then she was um, sitting at the end of the table. I couldn't stand up and go yeah, all the way. Yeah, that gentleman they say they like greet everyone and stuff. No. Yeah, and were um, you eyeing her from across the table? I didn't. I didn't see it to be quite honest. She was. I only saw it at the end of the evening yeah. when we were leaving. So we didn't even say a word to each other that night until uh, I had to say goodbye. Okay, but then when you said goodbye, were you like hello? <laughs> then I. Then we got uh, on Instagram, I mean on, on, on Facebook. Facebook. Yeah. Then from then on, I, I took charge. Okay, yeah. all right, yeah. all right. So you were aware of who he was in a way. You're like, okay, do you, do you now have to support the teams that he plays for? Or are you allowed to say, you know, support the Lions mm. or the Bull? No, I wouldn't no. do that. And I've always been like a storm. I've always been a rugby fan anyway. Uh -huh. um, so I always enjoyed it. My dad played and my brother plays a lot as well. But... Um, I yeah, I was always a Stormers fan anyway, so it kind of worked out well. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> when he finally moved across, you're like, yeah, yeah. Qu quiet victory. Amazing. And when you told your brother that you guys were dating, was he like, finally? So Sia actually and my brother are very close, and Sia actually told my brother first that he really liked me and stuff. And he used to come to me with stories like, do you know what you need in your life? So it's like, what do I need, Sia? This is when we were like really good friends. Yeah. And he's like, you need a boy from the township that's going to love you and be solid. <laughs> and I literally would look at him and be like, what is he saying? <laughs> like, where does he come he from? Hints, <laughs> hinting. You were not hinting. That was like flat out. Yeah. Like, well, who else do I, I, didn't I know? know? I don't know how to tell you, hey, I like you. So I had to just plant seeds. <laughs> <laughs> you need a guy from the township and yeah. you should have said, yeah. well, that's great. Can you introduce me to I one? I actually did. I yeah. told him, I was like, oh, do you know some? And he's like, me. Yeah. And I was like, I was like oh, oh well. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And there it was. But apparently, and I don't want you to tell us the story. I always like hears from women. <laughs> apparently, his like his proposal was quite romantic. So romantic. Tell us. And you know, I was yeah. never into. Um, I always hated like boyfriends and stuff bringing me flowers or chocolates and that sort of stuff. Like, and I always thought it was a bit awkward. Or like, if they sang a song, I was just like. Where, what am I supposed to do whilst you're strumming away at that guitar? You know, like, do you cry or do you, you like, oh. Do you, do you nod? Do you tell your I hair? 
<laughs> so I was like, I wasn't sure. So um, Sia actually whipped out all the cards for our, our proposal. He, for, for my proposal, he um, took me on a helicopter, but like he said, like pack a bag in the morning. Cause we had an argument like a few weeks before saying who could be like, who could plan the best date day. Mm. So I knew like a date day was coming and he said, okay, pack a bag. So I was like, okay, cool. But he didn't tell me anything. He brought me like flowers, made me breakfast in bed and then took me on a helicopter. But you know, everyone was really nice the whole day. So everywhere we went, they were like, hi, <laughs> hello. I was like, shame, maybe they're really excited. They're like, that is, <laughs> yes, yeah. And then, um, yeah, and then he proposed on the helicopter. But like 10 minutes into the ride, he was like, this is so crap. He's so like, take me down. I hate this. He's so like, because obviously a helicopter and airplane are very like different. different. Yes, because the helicopter. And we'd both never been on a helicopter mm. before. Oh. oh my word, he hated it so much. And I was like, shame, this poor guy. But isn't like, a helicopter like loud and you have to have headphones? And yeah. how do you, how does she hear your proposal? I was get breaking up as well. So he grabs my hand, but he's all sweaty. Like his hand is like sweating. And I'm like, what's wrong with you? Tough time, and he's like shaking my arm, <laughs> but I'm looking out here and he's like shaking my arm. So I like look at him and he's like, I have something I want to tell you. So I was like, I can't hear you. This <laughs> thing is not working. So he's like digging in his pocket and he pulls out like a 10 rand in a box. <laughs> so I was like, cool, maybe it's a little like sweet opportunity. Okay. And then, and then I realized, oh, shucks, he's actually proposing. And then, um, yeah, and then he, he was trying to talk. I told him like, take the thing off because I actually can't hear what you're saying. And then, but he, you don't hear because you're freaking out like I'm getting engaged and stuff anyway. Oh. So. Yeah, and then he took me like to this hotel for the night and stuff, and it was it was amazing. When the helicopter lands, do you grab your phone and like call your friends, like I'm getting married? No, we didn't. Even I, I was still like so shocked, and I'm like, oh, like amazing. So yeah, we we try to take some pictures, but they were terrible. You know, yeah. Like helicopter yeah. in the wind, just does, everything is hazy. Yeah. It just like, doesn't work out. It's well. okay, babe. The mem the memories. Yeah. The memories we got like that. champagne everywhere we went, so everyone was like, "Oh, here's a bottle of champagne," and I can drink like two glasses, and I'm like, out borderline. Yeah. So, okay, <laughs> really not a rugby chick. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so then, would you rather have to propose again or face like New Zealand in the World Cup final? I would face New Zealand in the World Cup final any day. <laughs> Yes, definitely. Any day. Yeah. Uh, can I take it as you telling us now that this is what's going to happen? This is the now near future. You yes. will take us to the final where we will <laughs> face New Zealand and you will win for us. Yes, can yes. I Yes, 100%. Yes. 100%. Yeah, I what, believe it. Yeah, what's he like before a game? Like, when do you notice that, like, oh, okay, like. The night big. before, I know, like, feed him and let him go to sleep and leave him like just let him do his thing because like I think a lot happens in their heads and stuff uh, like a lot of preparing and that sort of thing um so the next day I don't mention the game we don't I just act like it's a whole another day and then I'll just oh, wow. just say like I'll even I'll ne won't even say good luck or anything like that mm. I just kiss him say love you bye and See then it's gone. Mm. And where do you, where you, do you watch it at the stadium? Do you want to watch it on TV? If it's at home, I, I watch it at the stadium. Um, so now that our son is a bit older, we try like get him to go as well and, uh, and the kids enjoy it. So um, yeah, I always try to get to the stadium just to be there because um, so he knows like someone's there afterwards just in case. <laughs> Um, I just know with sports people, when they like someone, mm. they don't really want them to watch them, be it on TV or even at the stadium. Did you ever go through that where you didn't want to? No, well, I always wanted it. You always wanted to be yeah, watching? I always wanted to be oh, watching. Oh, you guys are so I even wave. <laughs> yeah, I get kisses. All the other wives and girlfriends are like, shucks, like we never get that. They'll be like waving and always after like a try or something, you'll be like. That one's for you, no, baby. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> it's too much. It's too much. Real talk is about real issues and real people. We would love to hear your voices. We now have a WhatsApp line. Mm -hmm. uh, 072 445 where you can send us your 20 second. Please don't make it long. 20 second voice notes telling us what you think about the show, anything that keeps you up awake at night. You can wake up at three in the morning and just like, hey, nail it, and start talking to us. We'll be playing some of these voice notes in the show as the days go by. So, send, send, send. We want to hear all of it. This is Real Talk on ACBC3. Stay with us. <laughs> Thank you. 
And welcome back to Real Talk right here on SABC3 where the stage is yours. Today we're chatting to the lovely Rachel and Sia Kolisi who besides having a beautiful story about their love, they've also been victims of malice because of their love. Mm. Now, you're used to being told nonsense because mm. you're in the public eye. Sometimes you do a knock on and then we get upset. Yeah, and then I'm you know upset. what? You do a knock on, I'm going to go on my Twitter and be like, yeah, go listen. Typical. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So yeah. you kind of assume that. Yeah. Now she's not used to that. Is that something that you have to get used to very quickly? Do you know, I was actually thinking about it the other day. The first, like, somebody asked me in one of the interviews, have, has someone ever done, said something to you in public? And I was like, no, no one ever has. But the one time we were out when we were first dating and this lady asked me if I was a prostitute. Oh, because mm. I was out with Sia and all of his friends and she's like, you don't have to do this for a living. I was like, do what? She's like, be a prostitute. I was like, I'm not a prostitute. Yeah. <laughs> but if I was, I'd be charging a lot. <laughs> that's what, that's what, that's what my mind is. <laughs> so, yeah, I think I had to get used to it, but a lot of it is, um, can be quite amusing. So mm. I think it's how you want to like look at it yourself, the perspective you give on it. So if you're going to look at it like it's, horrific and tearing your life down and the then worst all thing it's in the going world, to then be. yes, it is yeah. going to mess with your head. But if uh, you look at it like, shame, you poor people, then you're going to be fine. It's like, I'm happy this side. <laughs> yeah, life is just fine for us. Like, we're great, so, I mean... So, is there anybody in, in your families that you kind of had to convince of, of the other person? Like, you know, what, was your family immediately accepting of Rachel and was your family immediately accepting of Sia? Your, your I brother, think there obviously. were, like, a few... The, in the older generation side of my family, they yeah. maybe struggled with it a bit, but um, they respected my my choice and oh. my judgment, and they wanted somebody that loved me and respected me. Mm. So, why would you want someone you love to be with someone that abuses or disrespects yeah. or cheats or does yeah. stuff like that? To rather, you always want your the person that you love to be with someone that you know loves and respects them. You know, so. At the end of the day, that's what it came down to for them. And yeah. like, they adore him. Like, I don't think I've met a person actually that Sia, <laughs> <laughs> that Sia's met that has been like, oh, what a crappy person. Like, yeah. he's so annoying. Like, Sia's just a lovable human being. So. And you know, you actually touched, just, you said something so profound that if your family raised you to be a level-headed, mm. amazing human being who can make decisions for herself, mm. You know, that's what they wanted from you even before you met Sia. So yeah. why does it change now all of a sudden? Absolutely. You raised me to make up my own mind and now my mind is made. So mm. what is the issue? Absolutely. I like that. I hope people leave with that today. Yeah. And you, your family was like, gang ho, let's go. Bring it. Yes, my god. Because she came, when I came out of the bush, she came and she, she was cooking and everything. They dressed it up like we were They were so impressed already. I could cut an onion. I was like, guys, don't yeah. worry, I can even cook a chicken. Yeah. <laughs> like, step yeah. back. <laughs> this, this is just a preview. Yeah. So when all that social media hate was going on, and I remember I was like, you know what? I'm not going to read this thread because I, I don't want to make myself angry. Yeah. And then, you know, my friends kept on saying, no, man, this is rubbish. And my colleagues at work and everyone, they're like, no, no. So I was like, let me read it. So initially, I was like, annoyed and then i went to where you were i was like yeah but this guy's probably sitting in still by yeah. there <laughs> you know <laughs> you know what i'm saying yeah. Yeah. Okuruman, yeah. and yeah. life's not great for him yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you know he's just upset who told you guys about that post that malicious post that was making the rounds we were actually lying in bed the one night and it was like nine or ten o'clock i want to see his friend sent it Peg, to you yeah. Yeah. someone t no it isn't a friend it's just a, a person who just takes it and it had been going on for weeks yeah. yes i saw it it was yeah. like thousands of comments yeah, but we only saw it after yeah after, after it had everything. already become like a big then there thing. were other like um, interracial couples from all over the world posting pictures for support mm. yes. yeah so we only saw it at the end of that stage and then i read it i found it i found it quite funny sometimes we read the comments and we're like yeah. how do people like <laughs> Think of come all this up stuff. with yeah. this stuff like yeah. They're protecting white jeans. Yeah, and like, they must yeah. stay on their side and yeah. they must stay on our side. What a waste of a jean. <laughs> yes, I remember I read that one. Yeah. What a waste of good jeans. Yeah. And I was just like, oh, yeah. you know, like what is... <laughs> I'm just so confused. And yeah. also for me, because there's certain things that, you know, we amalgamated and we got to know each other as blacks and white mm. people. But I just felt like 
there's certain things you do where you kind of exempt from like the racial slur. Mm. You're like, guys, if I worked at the rock station, I think I'm pretty much one of you. You can't yeah, be racist 100%. towards me. So for you, I was like, he plays rugby. <laughs> like, he wins games for you. What more do you want? Did you not feel that a little about guys, these guys? I, I, yeah. play, I play the sport that means the most to them. Yeah, but some, well, he saw so one guy said you, you now you're stealing. What did he say? You're stealing our sport. Now you're stealing a woman. Oh, yeah. Oh. yeah. Yeah, that, that made it very furious. Okay. Yeah, I had to calm it down, relax. Because okay. you usually don't reply, but you yeah. replied. She replies. I, I don't, don't I reply never. to them. Uh huh. But I'll, I always think, try to think of something a little bit sarcastic that everyone can be like, oh. So it's not yeah. like so serious. Okay. So I'll never be like, you can't speak to people like this, blah, blah, blah. Like yeah. I always try to put a little like sarcastic tip on it. Um, but. I do think it's something that should be exposed yes. and spoken about. Yes. Like, and we are not the only people dealing with it. It's just that we are given a platform where it can be Ooh. exposed a little bit and spoken about. And it is something that should be because um, there's a lot of people that have to deal with it. But if they were to tweet it or something, no, they'll no, probably yeah. get like one or two retweets. This Nobody is cares. True. This is true. So the amount of like messages that we got from other people saying like thank you so much for like saying something and yeah. doing something and i was like guys like it's weird it's, it's, it's crazy it's mostly africans girls that are yeah. dating black guys and they say it's all like we hidden can't come and out. oh shame yeah, so like you know it's all like covert and yeah. they can't talk about it and finally but it comes to a point where i like say to them like Okay, if you love this person, you've got to start making some mm. decisions. Like yeah. you can't be sitting like fearful of your love forever. Go so like you're running a, a, a help center yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> I literally responded to every single person that inboxed me. Every single person, and uh. I got like thousands of messages. I'm thinking of like an acronym, so we could start something here: <laughs> White Girls for Black Guys. <laughs> like you know, you could run like you know, you've got a helpline, yeah. and they call, "Hello, the Sarki here." But they sound like I'm just like, <laughs> "Girl, you're." Oh, her flesh is like, oh, my family, my family's supporting me and I've got children, but I want to be with this man and stuff. I'm like, okay, let's look at priorities here. If you're studying or you have kids, that's your priority as a woman. Yeah. That's your priority, not your man, no matter what color no. or what race. No. It's like your priority is your education and your kids. So, so for some of them, it's maybe a bit of a reality thing, but. You, you just gotta be honest. I just want to be your friend because you just <laughs> right. She, she isn't she just like so like, you know. And now I can see how easy it was for you to adopt his his siblings. Yeah. And 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 just they're your kids. You, yeah. you raise them as if they were your own. Absolutely. Like it wasn't even a question. And I'm not about to come into this position of loving this man. And then saying, and I would expect exactly the same thing. If I found two siblings I didn't know about and they came into my life, I would expect them to accept them and be like, yeah, let's raise them. I'm not about to stand here and be like, oh, sorry, a 12-year-old and 9-year-old, we're not going to take you. No. So you are a mother of three? I am a mother of three. Mm. Are, are, we, are we going to be a mother of four? Yes, one day. <laughs> oh, okay, donkey. Be, listen, if you allow him, you'll be giving birth to an entire rugby team. That was my plan. Okay, that was, I really wanted six kids and then I had one and then we mm. got the other two and I was like, this is amazing. Mm. Like, we love, uh. like a big family, but like, you know, high school starts coming and then you think about university. And then he so loses his blazer. You've got to yeah. be like, and then he loses his space case and his school lunchbox. School shoes. And you're oh. like, you will go to school barefoot yeah. if you lose another pair exactly. of shoes. I, I make them go to school. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 30 seconds left before you go. What's your guys' song? Because I know like everyone is googie gaga of you. Now we just want to know what your song is. Adorn Miguel, Miguel. Adorn. Which one? Adorn. Adorn. Mm. Adorn Miguel. Yeah. Uh, let me. What? Yes. Baby, these lips. Go, babe. This is your Can't time. Can't wait to taste your skin. skin. Oh, baby. baby. No. Oh, no. Yeah. Let my oh, yeah. love. Let you love awesome. day. <laughs> <laughs> Every awesome man loves that song. <laughs> See ya and Rachel, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I don't know what we'll be talking about next when you come back, but I know you'll be back maybe when you win the Rugby World Cup for us. <laughs> Coming up after the break, I'll be joined by writer, filmmaker, playwright, critic, and sub-editor Neil Sonicus. He's got a new compelling book recently published, so for all the bookworms like myself, you want to come back for this. You guys are amazing.
And welcome back. So we've been celebrating love despite the in and the odds with it with Sia and Rachel Khaleesi. Now on the couch with me is Nell Sonicus, author, is it Sun or Son? Sun. Okay, author of Sun, a novel described as a fearless rendering of our times that deserves to be widely read and celebrated. Please welcome on to Real Talk, Neil. Thank you so much. And I understand you're sick. Yes, I've got a bit of flu. Is it like change of seasons? Because that's what happens to me. I no, I think it's the long flight from Auckland to Doha and then down to oh, Johannesburg after that. You, so you do live in New Zealand? I do, yes. Oh, why did you leave us? Um, that's a very long story. Really? <laughs> and it's, it's, not, it's not just It's that. a very long story, like yeah. this one, yeah? Yeah, well, that's not such a long story. Yeah. But, um, you know, you don't, do, you don't do things for one particular reason. There's a whole set of, of reasons why you do something, whether you stay or go, or in life, generally, mm. not so. The, the funniest line in, in, in this book I read was, you said you'd gone to visit a girlfriend, I think, in, in Zimbabwe. Yeah. And this was just after, uh, like, just as Mugabe was new as the rain. And you were like, you know, and the white people were still pretty happy with him. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about that time, because I just want to remember a time when people were happy with him. Well, you know, um, I got a lift with a, uh, at the beginning when I got into Zimbabwe. This is 1981. Yeah. I got in and um, I got a lift with a farmer. And he said, I'm very happy with Mr. Mugabe. Mm. Um, but then when I was on my way out, I mean, it was so nice being in Zimbabwe, you know, out of, out of South Africa, 80s yeah. South Africa. Yeah. That, that feeling of freedom was so good, I, I, I couldn't handle it. I had to get back home, back oh. to my chains. And um, I got a, but then I got a lift with a, a, a city engineer from Bulawayo. And back into South Africa? No, no, still in Zim, yeah. but heading towards the border. And he said, this country is in serious, serious trouble. Bulawayo's um, uh, power supply is, is virtually finished okay. so th those were the two like opposing the juxtaposing things. things that you were told yeah but the people on the ground like here mm. were fantastic mm. Mm. so growing up this side um as a kid did you always know that you want to follow like i don't want to say creative because you've to me it looks like you like the the intellect intellect side of creative you know what i'm saying oh. you're the writer oh. and you know the the script writer <laughs> and and you know what i'm saying you mm. like the the higher echelon so did I've, you always know that's what you want to do well from a yeah from a fairly early age i, I don't know about the intellectual part dreamer part but perhaps dreamer. but okay. my, yeah more more a dreamer than a than a, a deep thinker i think and what's the, what's the process of the the words finally ending up on, on, on paper, do they sit in your head for a while or do, do as you think them, you put them onto paper? Well, this, this, it's, it's also different, but you know, I like writing in the mornings like most people, I think. Uh. Um, and it's, you know, you try to, to, you try to write just, if you can do two to four hours every morning, uh. um, and sometimes you've just got to sit there and nothing's going to come and sometimes too much comes and uh. it's crazy, it's crazy. I find people who write a lot and are authors grew up in houses where there were always books where it was normal to read and that was entertainment. How was it for you growing up in your household? Mm, there were books, but the, you know, there was Reader's Digest, there was the Bible, there was romances. Mills and, and Boons. No, no, never, <laughs> never that. I'm, actually, there were, actually, there were. Um, and then there were Sex Manners for Men. Uh huh. And, um, you know, it, it, for a 14 or 16 year old boy, it was wild. <laughs> it was like, ooh, guys, you yeah. called your friends over. <laughs> yeah, no, but I, um, yeah, that's one of them. So, Len mm. in the book, mm. who's Len based on? I suppose he's, he's a fictional version of myself. Uh huh. You okay. Know? Because my father's portrayed as real and, and he's portrayed as, as, as a, 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 a fabrication. Uh huh. I just did that for various reasons, but uh, it's really autobiographical, I suppose. It is, right? Yeah. And so when you say based on various... Oh, I, Sorry. No, it's fine. You're sick. What must you yeah. do? Yeah. Um, so when you say it's based on like various versions of yourself, um, which part did you have to keep in about yourself when you were portraying Len? Well, I suppose all the, all the fantasies, the dreams, you know, this guy's got quite an, uh, an, an imagination when it comes to certain matters. Uh-huh. Um, sexual. Sexual. 
among others. I was trying to say certain and sexual came out because I was trying to <laughs> I was trying to figure out in my head how we're gonna get to the sexual part of this book. But now that we're here, we're I mean, you we're know, there. you forced me. Yeah. I, I really wasn't gonna go, but now that you pulled me in there, um, for instance, like there's a there's a part where he really goes into like the red zone of life, you know, mm. and, he's, and mm. he's, he's, he's with the lady at work and, you know, he's just on a, on a rampage. Is, mm. is that part of yourself? Is that something that happened to you? No, no, that, that's the fantasy part. But I, what I wanted to do, especially in the first part of the book, I wanted to show that sex is also very funny, you know. Okay, tell you me know? more. Well, I mean, he tries to get this girl into bed the whole time and she leads him up the garden path. She leads him on a wild goose chase, mm. sexually. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, you know, this is not Fifty Shades of Grey. No, it's not, because Fifty Shades of Grey is very, like, it's novel. I w yeah, I wouldn't know. I haven't read it. Yeah, haven't you read it? No. I've, I've read all three. You're not missing much. But, Thanks. I mean, they're entertaining. They're yeah. entertaining and okay. you, you love. But it's also written very badly. Don't worry about it. It's, there's, yeah. there's no flow for me, yeah, personally. Yeah. Okay, so... 40 years old, this, this guy goes through a divorce. Did that happen to you? No. No. So no. that's also a fantasy part. Yes. Who fantasizes about being divorced? Mm, well, I, I wasn't fantasizing about being divorced. I was imagine, oh. imagining what it, uh, what, what it was like being divorced. Uh -huh. My wife might argue that I've got a bit of a... Um, I'm a bit divorced from reality, but... Um, <laughs> But I've never been divorced, no. You've never been divorced? No. And the relationship Len has with his father, like, very strange. Like, I'll just mention one thing that I found to be strange. It kind of reminded me of Prince's wife when she said she never had his cell phone. He never wanted, he, he never wanted the wife to call him. And I was like, okay, that's strange, but, you know, each to their own. Yeah. When, when Len and his dad only speak on Thursdays, mm. um, did that really happen? No, no, I mean, n no, not quite, but I, I would occasionally call my father uh -huh. and say, hello, Dad, or, um, you know, I'm missing you, or I'm just checking up on you. I mean, it wasn't always that, that uh, well-intentioned, mm. um, but, you know, he was my father, and I called him on the day that he was murdered. I mean, we're gonna get, are we going to get to that? Yes, we're definitely going to uh, get to that. I called him on the day that he was murdered, and by then he was dead already. Um, and it's because I hadn't seen him that weekend before. Yeah. That was a, it was a Tuesday. Mm. And I hadn't seen him that weekend and I haven't, hadn't even called him. So, you know, you feel guilty. Uh -huh. um, uh, yeah, and then those, those things happened. Um, sorry, what was the question? We, I got no, distracted. No, I was asking why, why that like, said thing that you guys, you and your dad would only like, speak on Thursdays because there was like a thing about... Oh, okay, because it's the end of the Len's working week. And he's just calling up to, to say, are you okay? And I'm, I'll see you on Sunday. It's just a ritual. Yeah. The book's full of rituals. Okay. You know, visiting week after week, uh -huh. the same little speeches, the same little jokes. Mm -hmm. Like old people. He's an 89-year-old man. Yeah. You know, they get very repetitive. Did you ever feel like you were calling your dad out of obligation then? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. So it wasn't always just out of, you know, pleasure and... Uh, uh, the joys of spring. Uh, Sometimes you think, ah, oh, I'll do it. I don't really want to, but I'll do it. Uh -huh. There's a normal, normal father-son relationship. Okay, there's something you said in the book. It says, um, the dominant color of the rainbow has become not white, nor black, but red, blood red. You write that in the book. I'm going to have you have have you have a think about it we're going to go to an ad break mm -hmm. when we come back you and i we're going to unpack that and we're going to unpack the day you lost your father okay we'll be right back And we're back. Don't forget our weekly competition to stand a chance of winning yourself a 5,000 Rands e-gift voucher. Details are on the screen. Uh, I'm still with writer Neil Sonikos in studio chatting about his riveting novel, Sun. And before the break, I'd ask him about this uh, line that he wrote in the book. The dominant color of the rainbow has become not white, nor black, but red, blood red. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. It's very um, deep. It's what? Very deep. Well, it's, it's very primal, isn't it? Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just a simple, it's a simple um, view. Mm. And that is that 50 murders are committed a day in this country. Mm. And when I was writing it, that was, when I started writing it, it was 2009, 2010. Mm. 
And I thought, I'll write this as a record of that time, because surely by the time this book is written it will be and better. out, it will be better. Mugabe will not be in power anymore. Yeah. Nothing, just, has, nothing has changed. Nothing's changed, and the murders are still happening. Yeah. Um, are you comfortable to talk about the day your dad was murdered? Um, depends, depends. On? Um, well, um, the, the, you know, he was murdered on a particular day. We don't know who the killers, killer or killers were. Mm. So um, what else is there to, to talk about the day he was murdered? Um, well, I mean, I got a call and, to say that he'd been murdered, and that was obviously very... And this was after you tried to call him a few times, I suppose? No, I, ca I called him once. Yeah. And then I, I called my brother to, to go and check on him. Okay. And, and then much later that day... My brother called back and he said he's been murdered. Uh, okay. And you, and you say you don't know why he was murdered. You know, they could have just taken what they were taking and left him as is. Do you think that you're a little bit, and justifiably so, like, is, do you still harbor a lot of anger over that? A lot of, like, you know, unsettlement, you know, unfinished, unsolved? Um, unresolved, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. N you know, again, the, these things are never simple. Even, even the... S simplest so-called uh, or the, a murder that is supposedly so simple mm. there, there are always complications you know am I angry yes I am angry but this was a very very difficult old man who would not put up palisades he would not have security gate he had security gates which I could break with my hands mm. he had a little dashant a little dashant is not going to uh, uh, protect you against three killers yeah. coming coming onto your property so um I had to, at one stage, I actually thought, well, you know, if you are going to be so stubborn, if then, you're not, if you're not going to go into an old age home, then you must, you must take the consequences of that. Of course, I don't know if that was a good decision, but I thought that. Mm. I thought that. Is the final chapter dedicated to him? The whole book is the dedicated book. to him. Look at the beginning. Okay. It says to Rudolf Henry Okay, Sonicus. but I just think specifically in the last chapter, there's like a bit of therapeutic... I don't know, like healing from your side where you now you're speaking about it, but in more of a relaxed manner. Am I making up stuff? No, not quite. But it's, it, what it's really is, is, is about that last chapter. And I'm not giving anything away. Don't, because the No, I'm not going to say. But <laughs> we all have to say goodbye. Oh. That's what he's doing. He's saying goodbye. Okay. And, you know, saying goodbye to somebody you've known and loved for 52 years is not easy. Is that acceptable? Yes, yeah. very much so, very much so. Yeah, well, when you write your, do you, I mean, do you, did you write this with the, maybe the intention that one day it will become a movie? Well, I, I, first of all, I first of all wrote it as a book because I didn't want it to become a film script that ends up in a, in a trash can. Mm. So I thought, let me rather write the book. Which means that, you know, it's, it's got... It's a record, it's, it's a record. there. It's, it's published, you can't, do, can't take it away. Yeah, yeah which is difficult enough in itself, uh, getting something published. Uh -huh. um, and then, because I come from a cinematic background, yeah. I made three short films. Yes. I couldn't help thinking, mm, this might not make a bad film. What's the difference in writing for you when you write a book and mm. when you're writing a script? Well, heaven and hell. <laughs> writing Let's a script is heaven and writing a novel is hell. Okay, so why, is, why is writing a script heaven? When, when it might end up in a trash can somewhere. Because it's so much easier, writing a film script. Yeah, it's much easier. Okay, I did it for much longer. Yes. But uh, writing a novel is very, very difficult. Uh. Um, I hope to get better at it, though. You, so you're planning on writing another yeah, one? Yeah, it's on the way. On the way already. Yeah. And who is the person who has to read your work before the rest of the world can see it? Besides your publishing company to see if you're going to make the money or not. But just like your person that you bounce <coughs> off. Sorry. Um, there's no fixed person, but after a while you learn that certain people you can trust and you, you go to them uh. and they tell you what they think. And, you know, I used to make, when I was much younger, I used to make the mistake of saying, I know best and I don't, nobody knows anything and That's blah, blah, mistake. blah. Yeah. Big mistake. Yeah. You know? Because it's, inse it's, a, it's a sign of insecurity. As much as I know you're proud of your books, I just feel like you're more relaxed and happy about your film work. So which of your films that you have written, do you wish you could just erase it and have the pleasure of writing it all again? Oh, all of them. Really? You know, you want to always rewrite no, don't be like, they're all yeah. my favorite children. And, you know, I don't have favorites. You must have one that 
you know. Is the worst. Not the worst, but it's the closest to you. Oh, I th the last one I made, the, the one I made in, in New Zealand, uh -huh. I made with Sean Taylor, who's a South African actor. Yeah. And it's a, it's a South African Kiwi story, and, it, and I love it. Oh. I absolutely love it. I thought, sorry, I thought you made which is the worst one. No, no. No, 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 no. No, I'm just saying that, you know, when, you know, with musicians, when you ask them, you know, which is your favorite album, they'll always say it's the most recent one. And you're just like, yes, but you're saying that because it's the one that's currently for sale. No, I, I, okay. I, you know, I want from you, like, like the, the biggest pound of flesh that left your body for that specific script. Which one was it? Which one do you hold dearest to your heart? No, the, defi the, definitely the last one, but also because the first two were made under such duress mm -hmm. you know i had no funds i had to ask favors and that and i got really tense about it mm. whereas this last one I, i'd learned a couple of tricks you know and and sean is a fantastic actor yeah and the kiwi guy who was in a very well-known kiwi film was very good and i had a fantastic young kiwi crew who were very very good so it's a, a south african new zealand i was trying to cross it's barriers true. And I was, I was even using Kiwi music and South African music. I used a South African composer called Marcus Wyatt, mm -hmm. who plays the most wonderful um, trumpet. Do you, do you not um, fear that you won't get South African support because you're one of the ones that left? I don't care. <laughs> I love your honesty. <laughs> I really it's don't refreshing. care. People who want to read my book can read it, and those who don't want to, don't have to. Uh, and, and when, okay, books, yes, but then when it comes to your films as well, because I mean, you know, I, I like the fact that there's this Kiwi South African, you know, tri like not trying a bi nation thing that's going on here. Yeah. But do you not fear that like it won't land on South Africans because it's not like it's of somebody who left? I'm, I'm beyond that. I'm, uh. really, I'm really beyond that. Uh. You know, I'll, I, can, I can just, I've, I've just got a story to tell and. The rest is not up to me. And you can hear it if you hear it, and you cannot if you're not. Know. Uh, quickly, before we say goodbye, because, yeah. you know, I, I like touching on your dad. What lessons did your dad teach you? What one lesson did your dad teach you that, as much as you may have had your ups and your downs with him, but you know that that one has to stay with you forever? I'll tell you two quick ones. The one is that he always, the, the, he was a very simple man, but he always taught me by example, because he couldn't, he couldn't verbalize it. Okay. He taught me that sometimes... If somebody else is right, admit it, acknowledge it. Mm. The other thing he taught me, have we got time? Quickly, yes, quickly. very quickly. He taught me that old people can also change. Old people can also change. And if somebody is right, you've got to tell them that they're right. Thank you so much to Neil Sonicus. That's all the time we have for today. A big thank you to Rachel and Sia Khaleesi who joined us earlier on the show. But do yourself a favor. Listen. Refreshingly honest is all I can say about this book. You have to go and get it. It's Neil's book. It's available at your nearest bookstore. Join me again, same time and place tomorrow for another exciting episode where ahead of Mother's Day, my sister will be joining me. Timisa's in the house. Have yourselves a wonderful evening.